Ernst Schlesischer. Uh, he's from the GSC. Where is his bio here? Uh, Ernst is from uh, Netherlands. Uh, he did a MSc at uh, Utrecht and a PhD at Delft Technical. Uh, structural geologist uh, and 3D modeling expert for the past 25 years. Uh, he's worked 17 years at the Geologic Survey ITC in Netherlands, and then he joined the Canadian Geologic Survey in uh, 2007, where he continues to do 3D modeling uh, in geological, geophysical, and geochemical modeling for VMS and SEDEX deposits. And he's going to be talking about uh, the same subject, 3D high-resolution common earth modeling of the Lawler VMS deposit. Ernst. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. In this final talk of the Lala Symposium, I want to share with you the progress we are making in bridging the gap between geological and geophysical interpretations of the Lala deposits. So in, the, uh, in the, uh, these two days of, the, uh, of this symposium, we have been exposed to an impressive number of different geological and geophysical studies. But in the end of the day, we only have one subsurface geological reality. So uh, in the end of the day, we would like to uh, start unifying some of these different perspectives. And this is the whole idea uh, behind common earth modeling. OK, so um, our problem is a bit comparable to this old Indian tale about the six blind men and the elephant. Uh, they all touch a different part of the animal to feel what's like. And so one guy is uh, feeling the tail and he thinks it's like a rope. And a second guy is feeling the trunk and he thinks that it's like a, like a snake. And a third guy feels the leg and thinks that the animal looks like a tree trunk. In the end, they start comparing notes to find out that they're in total disagreement with each other. Um, well, we have some similar problems between geology and geophysics. <laughs> in geology, we're not blind, obviously, but we make, and to the contrary, we make highly deterministic observations. But inherently, they're very localized. So they're very localized to a piece of drill core, an outcrop of a mine workings. Uh, geophysics compensates direct visual access by sophisticated imaging methods. But with each method that we add, uh, we get another more global, but rather ambiguous and non-unique interpretation. So the whole idea about common earth modeling is, can we start to develop methods that unify this highly deterministic but local perspective of the geologist with the more global and ambiguous perspective that we get from geophysics? Now, there are several ways to go about common earth modeling. We can take a qualitative approach, such as we have apply, applied in the Flintlong camp, but we also can take a quantitative approach. In the qualitative approach, we bring in geophysical interpretations, geological data, and geochemistry into a 3D modeling environment, and we start making a 3D interpretation that is consistent this all the available data. So the output of that is a 3D model consisting of discrete units and structures. In the quantitative approach, the central role is played by a physical property model because obviously it's only the physical rock property model that allows us to link geophysics with geology. So what we could do through 3D modeling, we could upscale physical rock properties. We get a physical rock property model. We can run forward modeling. We get a geophysical result. And we can compare it to the measured geophysical data. We can also use that model as a seed model for inversion. And finally, we can use the physical rock property model to validate the inversion.
how do we make such physical rock property models? Now, one way to go about it is to make a discrete physical rock property model. And the big advantage of that is that we can bring in our geological expertise, our expertise on the geological structure of the deposit into the model. But how do we assign physical properties, physical rock properties? Well, the most obvious way to go about it is to choose to assign mean representative values to the various units that we have in our model. But the environments or the settings we are working with are highly heterogeneous. So we know that we don't have one particular single value within each of our lithostratigraphic units. We have a full histogram. We have a full distribution. So just assigning mean values to our units seems to be like a gross oversimplification. What about alteration? Well, we can easily make a zoning of our carbonate chloride pyrite index and say the threshold should be higher than 90. But why 90 and why not 95? And what values do we assign in terms of physical rock properties to this zonation? We don't know. Some problems. On the other hand, we could highlight the stochastic aspects of our data. So this is an example where we run a Gaussian sequential simulation on gamma-gamma density log data. So we get a very nice representation of our stochastic aspects of our data. But we grossly violate our expertise on the Geolo geological knowledge that we have on the geological structure of the deposits. So this is also not a good solution. So as you probably can guess, we need to combine the best of both worlds. And recent developments in hydrocarbon exploration and software modeling allow us to do that. So we can actually model our geology, uh, not in a Cartesian grid, but on a curvilinear grid. So the geometry of this grid respects our expertise that we have on the geological structure of the deposits. And the cells within it, within it allows us to do numerical analysis to have also to include the stochastic aspects in our physical rock properties. So this is so-called the so-called subsurface knowledge unified approach that allows us to do that. Uh, so we can then fill these grids with either categorical properties such as lithology or lithophasias or continuous variables such as our carbonate chloride pyrite index. And we can do that in three dimensions. So the big advantage of this is that we have a hybrid approach we combine deterministic uh, aspects, uh, aspects of our modeling as well as the stochastic aspects. How do we build such curvilinear grids? Very uh, briefly, these are the six steps. We first start modeling the fault structures that completely partition our volume of interest. In terms of the Lalar deposits, we only had one fault structure, and that is the famous uh, chisel laylor structural break that I don't dare to call a first fold yet. And we can then generate a fault block model, and that fault block model allows us to uh, model the offset along faults of our lithostratigraphic units. Then we bring our lithostratigraphic constraints from drill hole data. We start fitting geological services for that in step four. And in step five, we start partitioning the volumes, volumes in between those services with curvilinear grid cells. And in the final stop, step, sorry, we start filling this grid with either uh, <coughs> lithological properties or physical rock properties or lithogeochemistry. And this is what we have done at LALOR. So we have done that in uh, a rather small area, this surface area is about 1.3 by 2 kilometers and the depth 
of the model has a range of 1.5 kilometers. These, this slide shows you the various input data sets that were used for making this 3D model. And it's, basic, it's mainly based on the expertise of, of Alan Bills and co-workers because we use this geological map to extract lithostratigraphic contacts. Uh, we also used drill hole markers from his logging results. And we used angles measured in the drill core between bedding and the, and the axis of the drill hole to reconstruct strike dip measurements. In addition, we used a very dense drill hole database of Hut Bay that allows us to, uh, to provide additional geometric details. And the result is, is a classical 3D model like this, where you get a representation of your geological surfaces. So you see here the, uh, the top of the Belloc basalt. Uh, this surface is the Ghost Lake Rio Day site, treehouse, mavic unit. This is that structural break, and this is the hanging wall foot wall contact of the lala deposit. Now, once we have such a surface model, we can start gridding it. And here you see uh, a snapshot of that curvilinear grid, a 2D section of it. And you can recognize again the chisel lay or structural break. Now, then we can start filling the grid with, uh, with a lot of geological, physical rock properties or lithogeochemistry. And there is an additional genius solution here that we apply. Uh, we actually uh, use a coordinate transformation that transforms our geological structure, finite geological structure in geologic XYZ space to UVT space where UV represent paleogeographic coordinates and T represents geologic time. Now this is a perfect Cartesian space again. So we can apply all kinds of geostatistical methods in this Cartesian space and then transform the results back to our XYZ geologic space. And that allows us to take complex geological settings into account. So we can accommodate for fault as well as fault structures. Now there's several methods to, uh, that can be used to, uh, as numerical algorithms to fill the grid, uh, but it can be broadly subdivided into two classes. One of them is cridging or interpolation, and that, it, that technique is optimal in the sense that it minimizes the error variance. You can also take the critch estimate and the error variance and construct a local probability function from which we randomly can sample numerous realizations. So these are simulations, and you see a result for density here below. So we can apply these two techniques, both on continuous variables as well as categorical variables such as rock types. And for both, we can uh, quantify uncertainty, estimate uncertainties. OK, let's look now at some application examples where we think this approach is useful. Now, some of that has been shown already by my colleague, Gilles Bellefleur. And that is in making a lithofacius model from all the drill holes that we have available in this area. And this helps us in better understanding the seismic response of the deposit. So what we did is we took the original Hut Bay drill hole database, but that had 82 rock classes. We cannot practically use that in numerical analysis, so we generalized that into 15 rock classes. That made sense also in terms of comparing them with, uh, with seismic data. And you can start recognizing coherent units already when you do that. So a very dense nice data set. How did we apply the classification? Well, we combined broad visual classes coming from the drill hole descriptions with lithogeochemistry. So we had coherent volcanic rocks such as flows, then we had fragmentals, then we had finer-grained volcanic clastic rocks, lapilli, tuff, and tuff. 
And then we had rocks that with unknown protolith because of hydrothermal alteration, such as gneiss and schist. Uh, and then additional classes such as ore, argillite, and diorite. Now for each of these broad classes that were based on visual characteristics, we made an additional subdivision using the zirconium over titanium oxide ratio. So each of these broad classes was further subdivided into a mafic, intermediate, and felsic class. So this gave us a total of 15 different rock classes. Now, as uh, shown by uh, Gilles Bellefleur this morning, we can integrate that with the seismic response. And I'm not going to give you all the details because Gilles talked already about it, but I want to talk a bit more about this effect of hydrothermal alteration. So if we look at some of the strongest reflectors, uh, for example, this one here, you see it's in between mafic volcanoclastic rocks and felsic volcanic rocks, and we can actually trace it as a continuous reflector into the strongly hydrothermally altered and recrystallized foot wall of the deposit. Uh, so this seems to suggest that the seis seismic impedance contrast is mainly a function of protolith rather than anything else. And that is consistent when we make um, P wave uh, density plots and compare the hanging wall with the foot wall. So in the hanging wall, we see a very consistent impedance contrast between felsic volcanic rocks in yellow here and mafic volcanic rocks in green. And when we go to the hydrothermally altered foot wall, we see here the fels, the nice and schist with felsic protoliths in light blue and the ones with mafic protoliths in purple. And you can see that that main boundary in impedance contrast has not been changed. So it's sitting at the same position. And we could even argue that hydrothermal alteration has potentially enhanced the contrast if we uh, use the, uh, the wider distribution of this cluster and, and take that into account. So then we can uh, combine the, the lithiophasis model with larger parts of the seismic cube and this helps us a lot in, a, in using the knowledge that we locally acquired uh, in interpreting that beyond the drill hole extent. Uh, so we can uh, make an interpretation with much higher confidence than if we wouldn't do this. Um, I also want to make clear here that uh, geologists are not very used to interpreting this, this pixelized interpretations, but if we compare it to some of the recent uh, cross-section of Allen Bills, where we see this recumbent fault structure, we can actually start recognizing it also in our model. So we see the basalt here in the core of a synformal structure. Of course, not with the same amount of detail, but there's a lot of uh, additional structural details that comes out of, uh, of cridging results of this nature. Now, eventually, we want to bring this uh, into quantitative analysis. So we'll make stochastic simulation not only of density, but also of P wave velocity and shear wave velocity. And we can feed that, those results into forward modeling routines, such as SOFI 3D. Uh, we didn't do that yet for LALOR, but you see an example here of, uh, of um, seismic survey that was done at Flintflom, so that allows us to, to study the seismic response of the Millrock member here in Flintflom. And using these stochastic models will be the first time we can actually uh, use uh, the small-scale heterogeneities. So we could look at the effects of stringer sulfides, for example, on the seismic response. And it's only when you use simulation that allows you to do that because you preserve the local scale heterogeneities in your model. Now the second application example I want to show you is about the uh, borehole gravity survey. And we want to use the gamma gamma density drill holes to see if we can validate the results that we got from interpreting the apparent density logs. 
So this shows you the five drill holes again. Four of them are situated uh, north of the Lalor ore lenses and one of them south of it. And if, when we look at a particular drill hole, this one, where you can see in green the apparent density log, uh, we can plot generalized lithophasias and the zirconium over titanium ratio next to it. And you can see that the apparent density profile provides a kind of mirror image of our zirconium titanium oxide profile. So wherever we have an interval of felsic volcanic rocks, we see a peak in the zirconium titanium oxide profile, while we see a low in the apparent density profile. And the interesting thing is that we can start seeing similar relationships in the hydrothermally altered foot wall, again suggesting that the physical rock properties of the protolis have been preserved. We also see here a strong break that approximately corresponds to the mafic units here in the hanging wall and the gneisses in the foot wall. And that is the same contact that I showed you earlier on the seismic sections. Now, how do we uh, upscale gamma gamma density logs? Well, one way to go about is just take all the samples that we have along those drill holes that were acquired by DGI, and we have a total of 14,074 density samples there. But as you can see in the hanging wall, there is still a quite sparse distribution of your density measurement. So what we have done is we've taken an approach where we try to include geochemistry in the density estimation. So what we have done is we crit the iron oxide from whole rock analysis and we get a model like this and you can almost use it to because you see all the main units coming out when you um, interpolate iron oxide and iron oxide appear to be by far showed the highest correlation with, uh, with our gamma gamma density. So what we do is we don't only have the primary variable gamma gamma density in here but we use iron oxide as a secondary variable to estimate density. So that is what we call a co-cridging. So in co-cridging, we use uh, extra support variables to, to estimate the quantity. And you can see here the sample configuration where you see the, in blue the geochemical samples that gives you the additional support between those widely spaced drill holes where we have density measurements. Now this shows you the correlation between iron and gamma gamma density for both the hanging wall and the foot wall. In the hanging wall it's a clear function of your rock composition because in yellow you see the felsic volcanics again and in green the mafics. To our surprise that relationship was not that clear in the foot wall. You still can see the blue dots re related to felsic protolis uh, corresponding to the yellow dots here and the purple dots on this side but the correlation is not that good and it's more spread out. So I think that is a result of the disseminated sulfide mineralization that interferes with your, your protolith composition. Now this shows you the result of running a sequential Gaussian simulation on the gamma gamma density data with iron as a secondary variable and one without it. And we did a validation on that by uh, using 128 rock samples. And we got a root mean square error of slightly less than 0 0.2 gram per cubic centimeter. So you get a reasonable estimate of your density. Uh, we preferred this model, although the root mean square, square errors were similar, over this model because it, it showed us a much more coherent outline when we compare it to the units in the geological map. So you see the high density response of the Belloc unit and the low density response of the Ghost Lake Ryoday site. You see also the higher density response of the, the Moore Lake basalt and uh, pillow fragmental volcanoclastic in the direct hanging wall of the Lana deposits. So this 
model was still preferred, although the errors were very similar. Now the interesting thing we can do now is we can take our apparent density logs that were acquired by the gravity drill hole survey and sample from those density models the upscaled model density. And you can see that there is a reasonable correspondence between the two. Um, but locally, however, you see discrepancies. And these discrepancies, of course, are very interesting because it shows you something that is not in the model data, such as this small anomaly here, which could point to extra mineralization, for example, because it happens at the uh, level of the ore zone. But the most prominent discrepancy that we found is this one over here. You see a higher anomaly here in your model density that doesn't, cor there is no corresponding anomaly in your apparent density log from the gravity drill hole data. But you do see a higher anomaly in the gravity drill hole data here. So what is the reason for that? It appears that the gravity drill hole data were correct, but the geological model was wrong. Because if you plot the gravity apparent density profiles together with the gamma gamma density profiles here, you can trace the uh, lens 10 of the Lalor ore zone, the zinc rich upper level of the ore zone. Uh, and you can see that it's actually as soon as we hit this drill, drill hole, dub 279, it sits at a lower structural level. So what happened is that in our stochastic upscaling, we didn't have any gamma gamma density data available here. So we extrapolated where we had control to this position. And that is where exactly where we see the modeled density over here. So again, it is this informal structure that needs to be taken into account. So it shows you that this kind of common earth modeling where you try to reconcile different kind of data sets from geophysics and geological modeling, <coughs> it allows you to refine your model and, it, and, it, and the discrepancies are very interesting to analyze. We also made a preliminary ver version of an inversion this is the gravity uh, inversion using surface gravity data and drill hole gravity data done by, by a postdoc I'm working with, uh, Peshman Samsipur. And it shows you that there, you have a reasonable comparison with your upscaled density model. So you see the low response here in the hanging wall. You see the layered response here in the foot wall. We cannot take account, into account though this higher density values in the hanging wall. So again, uh, discrepancies that needs to be followed up on. So in conclusion, uh, the main conclusion I want to draw here is that quantitative common earth modeling is feasible, we get reasonable match. So if we uh, depart from geophysics, uh, we don't get something that is completely out of whack when we start from geology. We get a reasonable agreement and also when we compare seismic response to models lithophages, we can explain many of the reflectors that we see. So it is useful and it is feasible. Um, the discrepancies are very important because they provide follow-up targets for exploration and refining your model. So it's an iterative process. So I need to include that fold somehow into my new version of the geological model. The hybrid deterministic stochastic framework, I think, is very promising. And I think personally that if we wouldn't have used this approach, we would not, never have been possible to obtain these results. So you need to take the expert knowledge together with data-driven stochastic modeling into account. And as a final conclusion, we can, physical property data are often very sparse, they're expensive. So they sparsely distributed in mine camps. So an interesting approach is that we can densify them using little geochemistry. Thank you for your attention. Any uh, questions for uh, Ernst? 
Peter? In the example you show of the folk reading, uh, you have the two density models. And uh, it looked to me as though in the, in the, in the folk read model, uh, you actually had better coherency in the, on the, on the one on the left, you've got better coherency on the top. And on the one on the right, you've got better coherency in the bottom. You have that. Uh, yeah, the blue. The, the, you're referring to the blue line. The blue line, and, and also there's a red feature underneath it. It looks yeah. to me that from the blue line down, that, that that model looks more coherent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but from the blue line up, the left hand one looks more coherent. Uh, but those different ones. Yeah, I, I think that it could be again uh, a result of your data distribution where this data doesn't make use of the dense uh, lithogeochemistry. So if you have a co coherent signal here, you can again have an extrapolation effect. So you can extrapolate some coherent patterns that you have here to an area where you actually don't have samples. So, that, so that's what I suspect. But I would say overall, this provides a much better uh, uh, correlation, spatial correlation with uh, the geological units in the 3D model. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Our, uh